All right, so let's look at the legacy of ancient tech and how it applies to us. So uh, Akashi Kaikyo Bridge in Japan um, from Kobe City links over there, very turbulent but in a strong currents, very hard build. Now what they did was they, so to build these uh, foundation piers, they built these giant steel caissons, dragged them out and then sunk them by filling seawater, filling them with seawater and then concrete was poured directly into that, directly into the seawater. Now, it is possible to pour concrete into water, but it does affect the strength and the lifespan. Now, for instance, uh, uh, concrete boat ramps uh, and some smaller seawalls, uh, you can pour concrete into water, but it will affect the strength and the lifespan. So for structural support, no, you, it's a very different build. So usually what they'll do, if you want a strong foundation for a bridge for instance and you want to build a pier what they usually have to do is build a caisson or, or sorry a coffer dam or, and the same with sea walls they'll build a, a dam pump it out then pour the concrete allow it to dry before they let the sea back in however they did not do this with the um, Akashi bridge they poured it directly into seawater and for that they needed a very specific very special concrete mix to uh, do that well, and where did they get it from? Well, they, again, ancient inspirations. And so you see there's lots and lots of them. This is just one example of this Roman seawall, which has survived nearly 2,000 years. And it was made of concrete and it was poured into the sea, directly into the sea. Uh, now, the, the, the Roman con Romans had more like our normal uh, concrete based on lime. So what you do, you get limestone, you crush it up into small bits, then you heat it, you burn it very hot, you pour water onto it, then it's, it sort of dissolves into this fine powder. That's So your bag of cement, or concrete, uh, or the cement to make concrete, is just limestone which has been burnt, water poured on it to, create, to cause a reaction, and then that fine powder, that's weak. Now that's standard. However, Roman... Um, they also had that more typical of the concrete we have now, but they had a very different type of concrete as well, and that's the and that has enabled these structures to survive t two thousand years. Now, uh, our modern concrete doesn't work that way, so a lot of the buildings, first it's reinforced, reinforced. You get concrete cancer, the, the steel rusts inside and it breaks apart. But even unreinforced concrete. Doesn't after a few hundred years, it's not good anymore. It it, it gets stronger and stronger, uh, reaches its peak. I think about a, a, a couple decades after you pour it, concrete gets stronger, but then it starts well to disintegrate. So it's not a long it's not a long lasting material. But the Romans were able to do this with a special mix. So uh, after nineteen hundred years, the dome of concrete built on top of a pantheon is still the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world. Let's get an idea of a size. Now it's also a remarkable building because it's actually spherical. That's what's happened. Uh, and so the center point, the survey point from which the building is not on the ground, it's actually floating in midair. Just like the uh, the survey of of the aqueducts which is at an angle precise of an uh, orientation of a pyramid, but it, or it's not along the ground, it goes through the air. Fantastic, awesome, awesome surveying and construction, but because uh, there's a lot of records about it, it's, it doesn't clasp, because there's not a vacuum where you can insert any idea you want, well then it's not talked about because it's a problem that way. Now, entirely made of concrete, now this is a modern codes of engineering practice would not permit such mischief. So it's often said, oh, we can't repeat this with modern technology. Well, we can. Now, for instance, uh, you'll often hear even modern cranes can't lift it. No, no. The largest stone moved in antiquity can be moved by a single mobile crane. And mobile cranes are the worst ones to use. Because uh, they're useful because they're mobile. But uh, you compare it to other forms of cranes, and those cranes can lift dozens of times that weight. So, but anyway, off topic... This could be built, but no modern codes of engineering practice would not permit it. So that's why, uh, for instance, uh, the trilophons at Baalbek. We could cut, every day we could cut many of them, and we could place many of them 
with a with a single modern mobile crane. You don't have to assemble it. The one you can just call on the phone and they'll drive up you, you know, and come to you. We can do this, but we don't do this well for economic reasons. Lots of them, and uh, so why don't we do many of these things? Well, it's got to do. Well, it's not economic uh, for us, and uh, and workplace safety laws, insurance. It's a, these are a, a big issue. Uh, environmental law. So to, even just to open a quarry now is a minefield uh, uh, of you know, environmental protest straight away. So modern practices are different. Modern economic inf uh, uh, limitations are different. Modern mindset is different. So we want things done quickly. We want them done cheaply. We don't have an interest in in these old techniques anymore because well we do them our way and and we build things to last a century. We don't build them to last millennia. It's not the way we work, mate. We should go back and build things to last, but it's just like we live in a disposable age, and that applies to our roads and buildings as well. Ancient roads, buildings, bridges—they were thinking to 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 make things to last, and so there's an apple and origins oranges oranges comparison, but it's also well anyway now this was this particular concrete so it was more dense and the higher you get to the top the lighter it got because you didn't have to support uh, a weight underneath so that's how they were able to achieve this they also had an awesome understanding of of how to make things now whether they understood the uh, the chemical principles the way we do now uh, probably not but they did understand, for, at least through trial and error and experimentation, how to make really, really strong concrete. Now, for instance, Book 2 of Vitruvius, Chapter 5, Pozzolana. There is a kind of powder which, from natural causes, produces uh, astonishing results. It is found in the neighbourhood of, well, I'm not sure the exact pronunciation of that, in the country belonging to the towns round about Mount Vesuvius. These substance, this substance, when mixed with lime and rubble, not only lends to lend strength to buildings of other kinds, but even when piers of it are constructed in the sea, they set harder, they set hard under the water. And then it goes on to explain, basically, the volcanic regions produces this. Now he also mentions uh, alum or, or sulphur, or well, sulphur from volcanoes, but also uh, this compound alum, which is aluminium, which usually in uh, compound of aluminium, sulfur, or potassium, or ammonia, uh, used since ancient times uh, to make dyes and medicines. Now, speaking of uh, Mount Vesuvius, that's where Pompeii, famous Pompeii eruption was, and Pliny the Younger uh, witnessed the eruption, and in his letters describing it, it also shows a high level of understanding of the processes of volcanism. They weren't as superstitious that the gods, you know, they understood things, they were quite ad advanced, much more than is typically given credit to, and well, Pliny would have studied Heron, Vitruvius, uh, older writers, and Vitruvius, who write, he, he describes volcanism, and uh, in a way that is much closer to what a modern geologist would explain, rather than a purely superstitious way, which most often would be uh, pushed onto that mindset. No, but they're actually quite more sophisticated. And you can see the influence of earlier writers such as Vitruvius and Heron in the works of Da Vinci and Kircher. So Athenaeus Kircher wrote lots of books on many, uh, including uh, ancient Egyptian history and uh, many, many things. And you can see from Subterraneous Mundi, uh, again, how he's showing a understanding of the processes of volcanism rather than or a more superstitious way. Also, you get a depiction of uh, Vesuvius. But uh, Da Vinci and Vitruvian, well, Vitruvian man named after Vitruvius, that's, a, that's exactly where he got it from, chapter one, um, on the symmetry of temples and in the human body. You can pause and read, that's exactly what he's describing there. But it's also in book 10, now that's just uh, uh, showing the, the different chapters, but what we have is uh, hoisting machines, machines and implements, elements of motion, but also engines for raising water, water wheels and water mills. That's from Da Vinci. And the water screw from Da Vinci. Now even the pump of a water organ. All these machines of construction, uh, uh, hydrology, 
and machines of war can be found in these much older writings and it's you know the genius no doubt he was a clever fellow but the genius of of da vinci and the whole renaissance renaissance as in rebirth was a rebirth of this classical knowledge through writers uh well the, the famous classical writers plato Strabo, strabo heron vitruvius and all the others and highly recommend it they're free pdf downloads for the most part and so you don't have to outlay a huge amount of money to get these. You can download them, put them on your reader, your tablet, and you go through them. And it's, uh, again, there's a lot of cherry picking. So when certain descriptions uh, add to the mystery, let's say, of, of history, oh, then that's taken as gospel. But when they give technical, detailed explanations of ancient technology, this is uh crickets nothing to be heard in there that's that's not talked about and i would say it's it, only way i can understand it is an intentional uh omission uh by some and because I, I can't explain it any other way <laughs> well anyway so what you have uh, okay roman bridges are such as this in spain now this is just one there are countless roman bridges still surviving uh, two thousand years later and that adds to the 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 construction techniques now our bridges aren't are not going to last 2000 years yet these have and this is not by any means the largest as well uh they cro uh in i think even still the piers are still there from an older roman bridge crossing the danube and then in the 1500s they added the arch they put they put the arches back on top but the piers into the river are still there and yeah huge bridges and they've still they're still there and uh, and and in They'll probably still be around in a lot longer and if tomorrow our civilization was to collapse within a few centuries there'd be next to nothing to say we even existed the concrete would rust away all the other bits and pieces would break down probably uh, plastic and radiation would be one of a few things of a legacy of we were even around for quite some time but yeah so roman masonry concrete they could pour it into seawater and and it still is there now the bridges, the Pantheon, the Colosseum, and where did these, you know, the, the Romans and Greeks didn't just pop up out of the ground, so sanitation, met. so it's not just the, also the, the Roman technology that's so important, our, our systems of, of government and organisation are still based on Roman principles, and so that includes yeah, yeah, it's it's the org, even the way uh, our armies are arranged, for instance, still goes back to this this Roman principles of arranging uh, armies, but also the bureaucracy of organising things. Uh, the, the justice system has very heavy Roman origins. Even the English language is not really English; it's Latin, as in the Romantic languages, French, Spanish, Italian. Uh, but the Latin word, most of our words, especially our technical words, are of Roman Latin origin, and that's why in uh, when they talk in biology, we still use Roman or, or Latin terms because it, it's a technical language, and that's and English is essentially a legacy of the Roman language mixed with some Germanic and others. There are very few actual Old English words still in English. It's just uh, the the power of English is that it uh, swallows other languages and will um, incorporate them. But we're still our yeah, our language, our organize, our governmental systems, our, our arranging the military. The principles still all very very Roman. So whatever Romans done for us, well, a, a, a hell of a lot actually, and and we can see that not just yeah not just in the arrangement of administration so forth, but also in actual technical aspects now the romans didn't just pop up out of the ground they inherited older streams older systems of knowledge that they tweaked them they incorporate you know they dropped some things out brought some new things in they're also inventive so they did invent and add new things too but for the most part this system is part of a much older ancient legacy and uh, well, the thing is about the Greeks and the Romans, they wrote it all down in a language that is easily translatable, directly tra because it's still our language now, even English, is very deeply rooted in the Greco-Roman uh, systems. And well, voting and democracy, for instance, uh, has those origins there, but that's a lot of little small details here and there, but as, as a generally speaking, 
that's also part of this older legacy so with that hope you enjoyed have a good one there'll be some links in the description but you can use it